Thank you very much, Shona, and um, thank you all for coming along. This is Tanya, as she'll be telling you <laughs> silently. Um, once again, I find myself in front of an art gallery crowd, um, billed to speak on a subject for which I am lamentably ill-equipped. <laughs> Actually, my secret strategy for uh, these talks, and this is my third, has been to spend as much of my creative energy as possible in crafting a segue smooth enough to allow me to stop talking about art as soon as possible <laughs> and uh, start talking about politics, <laughs> about which I do know something and about which, anyway, it's possible to be an entire fraud without anyone really picking it up. Uh, the first talk I did uh, in this space was for the Archibalds, which was incredibly easy, art and politics. I could go on about that for hours talking about which politicians like which painters and why, and which politician once described the Parliament House art collection as avant-garde crap. <laughs> Can you guess which one, by the way? <laughs> Here's a clue. He's now the leader of the Liberal Party. <laughs> I couldn't be more thrilled. <laughs> The second Art After Hours talk I did was about uh, Monet and the Impressionists, which was a slightly tougher gig, but I managed by thinking laterally about various artistic schools and which politicians best represented each. But this time, I'm afraid, my middle stump has been bold. <laughs> Rupert Bunny, Australia's most underrated expatriate artist in his lifetime. A man whose wholesale assimilation into swinging late 19th and early 20th century artistic Paris left him lit literally a world away from the sun-bleached nationalism explored by his comrades of birth at the same time. Try relating him back to politics. Although, <laughs> once or twice in the last week, I've wondered if the hallucinogenic, fast-paced world of fin de siècle Paris with its orgies of excess and its reckless, fast-paced disregard for convention, might have some quite poignant parallels with the contemporary Liberal Party, <laughs> which has been commanding everybody's attention for the last fortnight. Did anyone see that fabulous story at the weekend about Tony Abbott and his teenage experimentations with marijuana? I mean, it's the obvious question that they all get asked now these days, and the Sunday Age asked it for the weekend. And when Mr. Abbott was asked by Josh Gordon, the Sunday Age's political editor, whether he had in fact ever dabbled, he revealed that he'd tried to smoke a joint whilst on a teen teenage rugby tour of the United States, but was quickly defeated by a coughing fit. Later, however, he, he revealed that while on his way to Oxford to take up his Rhodes Scholarship, he was traveling through India when he was offered a cool drink of Lassie that was proffered as a specialty of the house. It turned out, said Mr. Abbott, uh, Abbott to be some sort of hemp yogurt. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Abbott testifies that he was, quote, away with the fairies for about 12 hours, <laughs> which caused many of us to wonder <laughs> what happened in those 12 hours. My own suspicion is that a vision of his late 2009 reshuffle <laughs> swam before his eyes like Kublai Khan. <laughs> and it just took him another 30 years to get it down on paper. <laughs> Seriously, can you imagine what sort of substances it might have taken to give even a young man of vivid imagination the idea for a National Party MP in the finance portfolio? <laughs> or the extraordinary duo of Conchetta Fieravanti Wells and Bronwyn Bishop, the right-wing Bronnie and Connie show, <laughs> ministering to the frail aged. <laughs> Still, in his defense, you would have had to take some serious anti-stimulants to come up with a prophetic vision of the Rudd government, so perhaps we shouldn't be too harsh. <laughs> there I am, digressing again. Back to Bunny. Isn't it fascinating that even now, after all of these years, we're struggling to fit him into the Australia we know. He's an important part of our expatriate conundrum. Rupert Bunny, 
Artist in Paris is the title of the exhibition. But subtly, when we're thinking about him, we supply the missing four syllables. What we really mean is Rupert Bunny, Australian artist in Paris. Why else would we be here? Why else would we be seeing this exhibition? We need to rationalise him in some way to give him some context, to own him. Now Stephen Fry, that cultural omnivore and pop anthropo anthropologist of the British intelligentsia, had some plangent words to say on the subject of Australian self-regard when he visited Sydney several years ago and gave an interview to my ABC colleague, Richard Glover. And here's what he said. I won't attempt the Fry um, accent. Was there ever a clearer example of an inferiority complex than the Australian attitude to itself, wondered Fry. You must learn, and I mean this in a kind, caring and loving way, as Dame Edna Everidge would say, not to mention the word Australian in absolutely everything you do. I mean, if there's a park bench, it says, sit down, Australia. <laughs> if there's a mint, it's the great Aussie mint. Everything is, Australia, you're Australia, and Australia says Australia. You know, shut up. Just, you know, you don't need to do that. You're a wonderful country. You're one of the most fantastic countries I've ever visited. It's one of the hardest countries to leave. I mean, how could anybody not live in Sydney? It's just absurd. It's ludicrous to live anywhere else. <laughs> you don't need to tell people. Just have a commercial that says, this is a good car, or this paper is for wiping your bottom. <laughs> not, wipe your ass, Australia. <laughs> it's the great Aussie ass wipe, or whatever. <laughs> now, of course, Fry is English, so he would say that. It's his duty to be patronising and dismissive of the Antipodes, even if he does have fantasies about living on Balmoral Beach. And it's our job to laugh good-naturedly and acknowledge with a twinge that he's probably right, while secretly being pleased that where he is right now, it's about three degrees. <laughs> and he'll be nestled into somebody's fetid armpit in the tube. It reminds me of Clement, Clement Freud's brilliant remark about New Zealand when he, when he said, yes, I've been to New Zealand, although it appeared to be shut. <laughs> <laughs> we are funny about our expatriates, though, aren't we? we? We don't let them go. We keep checking on them. Like parents who want their children to do well, but not so well that they don't occasionally fall prey to homesickness. We want them to prosper, but also we want them to fall apart occasionally in such disrepair that only a sensitively administered course of home cooking will make them better. We love the fact that Rupert Bunny was a fully integrated Parisian painter, but that doesn't keep us from scanning his canvases for a flash of Australian light, or a sign that just occasionally he got cold, or annoyed by the persistently poor standard of French plumbing which has, of course, not changed much in the course of the succeeding century. Partly it's jealousy, too, I suppose. How about this passage? It's a recollection from the diaries of the Hungarian writer, Zygmunt Just, describing the shared studio occupied by Bunny on the Rue Notre-Dame des Champs in 1888. He writes, Bunny is there when I arrive. He's painting. A large Algerian plein air picture hangs opposite the entrance, given to him by a friend. An upright piano stands beneath it. In one corner, an attractively arranged sofa, oriental carpets and bamboo cloth, which runs halfway up one side of a large glass partition. A Turkish trestle stands near the side of the sofa, which holds daggers and fans, etc. On the far side of the studio is a faded blue cloth tent. This is where the artist lives. Sketches and half-finished paintings cover the walls. Well, I would like my Paris apartment to have that kind of feel too. And this, keep in mind, is before he even started hanging out with Sarah Bernhardt, Auguste Rodin, Guy de Maupassant, and Oscar Wilde, and well before he married a hot French model. So is it any wonder that when he periodically returned to the country of his birth, his countrymen rolled their eyes and said things behind their hands like, well, his stuff reeks of mannered artifice, in my opinion. 
Bunny broke the rules by not missing Australia enough, by not mentioning us enough, by not referencing us enough in his paintings, by falling in love with that soft light and the Belle Epoque and not giving much of a toss about Australian federalism. <laughs> Someone like Germaine Greer, by comparison, plays by the rules. She's integrated herself into a foreign country, but she can't stop talking about Australia. It's like picking a scab. <laughs> she can't leave it alone, and we can't leave her alone either. I went to a function at Buckingham Palace with her once when I was living there. It was the Queen's annual function for Australian expatriates. A large event at which two queues traditionally form. One, a reception line in which visiting Aussies twitch nervously, trying to remember how a curtsy goes and hoping against hope for a clangor from Prince Philip. <laughs> and the other, a discreet queue for the bathrooms populated by Aussies who have no intention of using the facilities but are nevertheless determined to pilfer a couple of squares of royal sorbent. <laughs> when I introduced myself, Greer declared that she had no interest in making any comments to Australian journalists. Instead, we had a slightly odd conversation about placentas <laughs> and whether one should eat them oneself after birth or simply bury them in one's garden. I was, once again, pregnant at the time, so it's not as odd as it sounds. Um, she recommended that I desist from placing my placenta in a bin, owing to the ingenuity of London's urban foxes. <laughs> I thanked her. <laughs> and later I noticed her giving an interview to AAP. <laughs> she knows the rules. <laughs> but Stephen Fry's remarks mock at the dreadful, anxious heart of the cultural cringe. We're obliged to be obsessed with ourselves. Who else would be obsessed with us? <laughs> and we're so far away from everything. How are we to know if what we hear is the real pulse of opinion in those faraway lands from which so many of us anciently derive, or just the echoes of our own fretful inquiries? We're always listening out for signs of our own reception overseas. Who can resist that guilty thrill of excitement when we hear our Prime Minister's name mangled by American journalists <laughs> when he's travelling abroad? When Malcolm Fraser is introduced as John Fraser, <laughs> or John Howard becomes Paul Howard, or even John Hunt, as he did in, at various points during our loving initiation into the Coalition of the Willing? George W. Bush's last visit to Australia during the week-long lunacy that was the APEC summit in 2007, another period in Liberal Party self-management that might well have been sponsored by Tony Abbott's Indian crazy yogurt vendor, <laughs> featured a final variation on this theme when he thanked Austria for, for hosting <laughs> APEC. He knows the rules. But to be an Australian living in the Northern Hemisphere is to feel a cocktail of emotions about the way your homeland translates into that strange grey light. It's a confusing phenomenon. To pick up the times, the day after a shark has eaten a pom off some Australian beach, <laughs> and feel jadedly contemptuous about the fact that the British papers always use the same picture of a yawning great white every time an Australian shark eats someone and to feel also, inexplicably, slightly proud of the shark. <laughs> you know, if, if we were to take this expatriate obsession to extremes, we would be much more possessive of sharks. <laughs> Did you know, for instance, that the pickled shark that really propelled that international fraudster Damien Hirst to superstardom was an Aussie shark? <laughs> that shark which was a 4.3 metre white pointer, was sold to Hearst by the Queensland shark fisherman Vic Hislop in 1991 for 10,000 Australian dollars. Now sure, Hearst did some stuff to that shark, like pickle it and build it a giant tank and give it a silly name, the physical impossibility of death in the mind of something living. But consider that in 2004, 
that pickled shark was sold for 16.2 million Australian to an American businessman. Now you might call that a triumph of sensibility. I call it a kick in the guts for Australian small business. <laughs> Incidentally, when the Saatchi Gallery uh, moved the, to, the, to that enormous county hall building on London's South Bank, there to exhibit not only the shark, but also Hearst's creepy dissected cows and maggoty sheep's heads and so on, as well as Tracy Emin's bed and all the rest of it. They included a little annex off the exhibition, which was devoted to newspaper cartoons taking the mickey out of the young British artist movement. Quite a substantial collection of cartoons, as you can imagine. But the best one by far depicted an Eskimo family visiting a gallery to stare at the, impo the physical impossibility of death in the mind of something living. The father Eskimo remarks to another onlooker, my five-year-old kid could have done that. <laughs> <laughs> I do have, this is unforgivable I know, but I do have one further digression on the topic of the shark. You know, death may be a physical impossibility in the mind of something living, but decay, as it turns out, is far from impossible in the physical manifestation of an improperly pickled fish. <laughs> and within two years of the American businessman's purchase of the Hearst shark, it had rotted so badly that the artist was obliged to brine him another one, <laughs> which necessitated a return trip to Vic Hislop. <laughs> go Aussie, go. Seriously, back to the issue of our relationship to the world around us. It's something that we're constantly checking, measuring by all measurable means, like beavers fussing around the boundaries of our lodges. And to be sure, a lot of this is our fault in the media. Nothing gets us going faster than a good old international report from some bodgy outfit with all the heft of the Ponds Institute indicating that Australians are now officially the second most fat-bottomed people in the world, or the more an most anxious, or the most inclined to be turned on by the colour turquoise. <laughs> We're obsessed by charts and where we appear on them, or more ominously, the charts on which we do not appear at all. Oh my God, Australia's not even in the top 10 llama-owning nations in the world. <laughs> Stage a public inquiry, our consumption of fish oils, seasonally adjusted, has now dropped below that of Tunisia. <laughs> but it's not just us, you know. In Question Time, Kevin Rudd devotes hour upon hour to the monotonous recital of international monetary fund data on the gross domestic product of countries being less grossly productive domestically than we are. <laughs> and then, just when you think the human body can stand no more, He'll move into public debt over GDP, and that will last for another hour. <laughs> Every time we get a mention in The Economist, I worry that Wayne Swan will expire of happiness. <laughs> now, my own theory is that we're not going to get past this inferiority complex thing until we can dis distract ourselves by getting on genuinely bad terms with another country. And our geography, unfortunately, precludes that. We're simply too far away from most countries to foment a genuine contempt for them. Let me explain. Have a look at Europe. Hardly anyone there has a genuine self-esteem problem. And the reason there is that in Europe, they work on a geographical matrix of contempt. You despise your immediate neighbour, and everyone understands that. The Poles make fun of the Czechs, the Czechs make fun of the Slovaks, they exercise all of this in a healthy way by diddling each other at the European Parliament and, of course, more importantly, the Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> Look at France and Germany. The rules there are perfectly well understood and have been for generations. The French take every opportunity to be rude about German food, while the Germans retaliate by commandeering sun lounges on the Riviera. It also works if you're an island, but only if you're close. The French feel a consistent sense of superiority over the English, based on the propensity of the English to chatter incessantly about the sexual peccadilloes of their politicians and to lie about in their underpants in parks on warm days. <laughs> the English take their revenge by boasting about the strength of the pound, 
monitoring the paltry annual French domestic demand for soap, <laughs> and buying up crumbling homes in Provence, then forcing the French to read their wry memoirs about doing them up. <laughs> and every now and again, they all go to war. And what is the result? A perfectly hardy national self-regard all round. I'm going to slightly irrelevantly read an extract from the poem Beppo by Lord Byron, mainly because as a nationalistic creed with a touch of self-effacement, I think it strikes exactly the right note. England, with all thy faults, I love thee still, I said at Calais, and have not forgot it. I like to speak and lucubrate my fill. I like the government, but that is not it. I like the freedom of the press and quill, I like the habeas corpus, when we've got it. I like a parliamentary debate, particularly when it is not too late. I like the taxes, when they're not too many. I like a sea coal fire, when not too dear. I like a beefsteak, too, as well as any. Have no objection to a pot of beer. I like the weather, when it is not rainy. That is, I like two months of every year. And so God save the regent, church, and king, which means that I like all and everything. Our standing army and disbanded seamen, pause rate, reform, my own, the nation's debt. Our little riots just to show we're free men. Our trifling bankruptcies in the Gazette. Our cloudy climate and our chilly women. All these I can forgive and those forget and greatly venerate our recent glories and wish they were not owing to the Tories. <laughs> you know, Britain's self-regard improved immeasurably when it invaded the Falklands. I'm sorry, but it just did. All of a sudden, all of the self-loathing of the winter of discontent and the deep-rooted suspicion about the steely-eyed Margaret Thatcher rearranged itself into a festival of nationalistic fervour about a tiny little rocky outcrop that nobody had much noticed until Argentina decided to grab it. A fight between two bald men over a comb is how Jorge Luis Borges, the Argentinian writer, memorably characterized this battle, but it worked. Please do not think I'm endorsing an immediate invasion of Mauritius. I am not at all. All I'm saying is that Australia has always got along pretty well with its neighbors. Even our military intervention in East Timor was rather more pro-Timor than anti-Indonesia. And I'm sure that our lack of natural hostility to anyone in particular, sporting rivalries notwithstanding, contributes to our excessive interest in self-analysis. Now the final point to make about Rupert Bunny, <laughs> <laughs> who am I kidding? as if I've made any points at all about Rupert Bunny. <laughs> Sorry, Rupert, it's a lovely exhibition, go and see it. <laughs> Is that he's not even our best known expatriate Rupert. <laughs> and Australia's relationship with its own principal Rupert is a deeply complex phenomenon. He is a creature of fascination with his American passport and his growing st stock of progeny and his indefatigable genes. More than any other expatriate, perhaps, he has superseded questions of nationality and ownership, possibly by the simple expedient of buying everything that's not nailed down. <laughs> but he retains a certain godlike status for politicians in whose veins run the chilly certainty that it is not a good idea to make him angry. This does not only occur in Australia, it occurs in Britain and the United States too. And yet, he is, in one way or another, at odds with the prime ministers and presidents of all three jurisdictions. The Obama administration having been targeted furiously by Fox News of late, the Brown government having been spectacularly disendorsed recently by The Sun, and the great Rudbot himself having been described by Mr. Murdoch as being the possessor of a glass jaw. <laughs> Incidentally, the best declaration of editorial intention I ever saw was in Britain in 2005, when the general election fell just after the death of the Pope. 
and the square out of the front of the Vatican had been crammed for weeks with live TVs reporting the death in succession, sometimes in uncomfortably intimate detail. So to announce its decision on whether to support Tony Blair or the conservative leader Michael Howard, the Sun instructed all those interested to keep an eye on the compound roof at Wapping and at the ap appointed moment released a puff of red smoke. <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> but this other Rupert, I think, is our new breed of expatriate. A Rupert who is not only conscious of the collapsing boundaries between countries, but who is actively encouraging their collapse. Now, we can't examine this Rupert's work and weigh up the percentage to which he remains Australian. Although you'd be pretty safe in guessing that the hair is mostly American, I think. <laughs> From a lengthy and infamous start as the dirty digger, this Rupert is now a mogul of various addresses. I hope you enjoy the exhibition. I apologise to the original Rupert for my serial disrespect and lack of attention this evening. But the vision of his artist, Paris Garrett, which is an ex expatriate charm of the past, is no less bewitching for that. Thank you very much.